266. Present Orientation. Calcedon Report No. 68, April 2nd, 1971. A lower class society is one in which the spirit and will of the lower class predominates. Practically, this means that the society becomes present oriented and is governed by envy and class hatred. The lower class mind does not respond to excellence with respect or a desire to excel. Its reaction, instead, is to hit and to tear down, to level all things to its own status, instead of seeking its own advancement by work and emulation. Instead of having working goals, either independent or imitative, the lower class mind responds with envy and hatred. Whenever a society sees the rise to power of a lower class, it also sees the growth of class conflict and social warfare. When this happens, it is also a part of a parallel development on the upper levels of society, the breakdown of the upper class. Power is turned into licence, and responsibility is abdicated. The monarchies of old Europe, for example, had become thoroughly lower class. They were pleasure and present-oriented, contemptuous of moral responsibility, exploitive of the poor, and heedless of the future. Instead of respect, they excited envy. Wealthy and the poor increasingly had a common social goal to live it up and to exploit the opportunities of the present without regard for the future. The poor envied the nobility because they shared a common, present-oriented goal. Society was given a new leadership and rise of a class of merchantmen, entrepreneurs who were future-oriented, and social renewal and progress followed. Now, however, the decay of that class is again creating a growing mood of envy and class conflict. The basic answer to social problems is again the revolutionary and lower class alternative of levelling. But where class conflict begins to govern, progress wanes proportionately. Some years ago, as a student, I recall hearing the passionate defence of his country by foreign students. Someone had questioned the native ability of his people by calling attention to their lack of progress. His answer was in essence this. We have a large number of brilliant men, many educated in America, but we do not have your religious situation, nor your freedom. Certainly we do not have your moral stature, so that credit and honesty in transactions is impossible. Policing is largely a personal matter. There is so much lawlessness that a fair share of our income goes for bribery and protection. Survival and self-protection take up so much of our time and income that too little is left for capitalising society. We have the intelligence and resources, but we do not have the background of America's Puritan self-discipline, and so our capital and energies are dissipated and progress is difficult. He could have added that most of their energy also went into class warfare. Consider the plight of North Ireland and of England today. Religious warfare in the one and class war in the other are destroying these countries. Industry is leaving. Superior men are beginning to migrate elsewhere and social energy goes into conflict rather than into progress. Where the commitment to social conflict is deep or total, peace and progress becomes difficult or impossible. In the Soviet Union, class warfare is a matter of religious and philosophical principle. The ills of society are always ascribed to a hostile class. This means that there is a built-in inability to cope with problems because the principle of responsibility is denied in favour of environmentalism. An evil, hostile class is always responsible. The bourgeois mentality is credited with pervasive powers and conspiratorial activities against the regime, and therefore unrelenting warfare is the answer. This warfare continues from year to year, but the inner problems are not resolved. Instead, they are aggravated. In Western nations, class conflict is deepening. It is the lower class answer to problems. Instead of developing spiritual, moral, economic and social capital, the people increasingly want to blame their ills on a clique, class or cabal. Such groups exist, and a lower class society makes their spectacular rise to power possible. In a class warfare society, conspiracies and revolutionary disturbances proliferate, 
because every faction begins to see them as both the answer and the threat. A society which assumes that class conflict is a natural and permanent state of affairs is doomed. It has lost the capacity to be a society or a community. Instead, it is now a battlefield in which all peoples are the potential victims. To demand class warfare is to commit social suicide. There can only be a society where there is a harmony of interests. The word society in Old English meant what we now call communion. The Apostles' Creed before the Norman Conquest read, instead of the modern, I believe in the communion of saints, and of the saints, the society. Without either the saints, the believers, or the communion, there is no society. The modern liberal is well aware of the need for communion. His goal is a society living in peace. His answer, however, is to ignore the fact of sin and conflict and to insist on peace by enforced legislation. By neglecting sin, he negates the roots of conflict and by trying to legislate peace, he aggravates the conflict. As a result, the nation drifts deeper into class conflict. Let us consider one aspect of that conflict, the racial situation. The attempts to force integration and to force segregation by law are very old. With Assyria, forcible integration was a policy of state. All these attempts failed when the social conditions militated against them. If two peoples were relatively equal and religiously congenial, integration quickly followed, despite all legal obstacles. Where the differences were marked, neither opportunity nor law was able to bridge the gap. Neither legalised integration nor segregation accomplished anything more than to aggravate a situation. To introduce the states into an area of personal, religious and moral decision is to abdicate the harmony of classes for a statist imposition. If a person or if a people are inferior, nothing can compel their rise. If they have a potential, why prevent their development? Where there are religious and social reasons against mixed marriages, nothing can further such marriages as long as the faith and the society are strong. If these factors are invalid or disappear through disbelief, nothing can prevent integration in the short or long run. The energy expended on both sides to force by law what is an aspect of principle and based on a way of life is a waste of energy. To rebuild or to build a society, develop your faith. The modern answers are statist. The state takes over, for example, education, and then the factions struggle to control the state in order to impose their concepts by force. The result is class warfare. Where people are free to establish their own schools and do so, the decision is then their own. In statism, men try to decide for others rather than for themselves. A harmony of interests is not the same as an identity of interests. The goal of class warfare is to create an identity of interests, to level society to one status and a common interest. Such a society is of necessity totalitarian and equalitarian. A harmony of interests assumes a diversity of interests. This the totalitarian mind opposes. I recall, not too many years ago, not a symphony concert, listening to the many foreign tongues spoken in the lobby. A fair percentage of the music lovers were of foreign backgrounds. The resentful reaction of one person was, They're in America. Why don't they speak English? Of such stupidity is class warfare begotten. Is there an obligation to hate their homeland and loving their new country? Must we have an identity of interests? in order to be unified as a people. An identity of interests is not compatible with freedom, nor is it possible. A harmony of interests allows for the free, independent, parallel and unified development of classes and races according to their progress and achievement. The consequences of a harmony of interests are social, economic and political. Its roots are religious. Only when men share a common faith in the sovereign and almighty God and his government can they recognise a common law and destiny. Amos rightly asked, 
can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos chapter 3 verse 3 One of the first steps towards a harmony of interests is for man to recognise that the government of all things is not upon his shoulders, but the Lord's. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 This means that he cannot absolutize his thinking nor project his own will against history. God always remains the Lord. God, having made all men, all races and all classes, has his purpose and his judgment in mind for all. Our duty is to fulfil our calling in our place and to uphold God's law order in all things. The force of God's law must be maintained against all men, including ourselves. Our relationship towards other classes and other races cannot be essentially one of warfare, integration or segregation, but basically one of a. requiring all to obey God's sovereign law and b. proclaiming the saving power of the gospel to all men. Neither church nor state can require more than that legitimately. In class and race warfare, the warfare is first of all against God and his law order. Victory in warfare can impose a truce, a cessation of formal warfare. It cannot bring in either peace or a solution. Nothing was settled by World War I, except to lay the foundation for World War II, which, in turn, has even deadlier consequences in store for the world. The drift is steadily into a more radical conflict and a greater loss of freedom. We must, therefore, rebuild the foundations. We cannot assume, with the foolish liberals, that the response to their peacemaking is peace. Their concept of peace is not God's peace, and it does not have his blessing. Neither can we assume, with many foolish conservatives, that the answer is in making war victoriously. To win a war no more eliminates our moral crisis than losing a war. It only eliminates an enemy outside, when the greatest enemy is within. Short-term gains cannot eradicate major and abiding losses. A dying man who becomes conscious and talks briefly has not thereby escaped death. Our real sickness is moral and spiritual, and our real solution rests in a religious renewal, in personal and societal regeneration. Envy, hatred and warfare offer easy and ready answers to the lower class mind, but the results are short-term answers and long-term disasters. For the upper class mind, the answer is not warfare, but reconstruction in terms of him who said, Behold, I make all things new. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5 The grace of God can keep us from envy and hatred. His grace can make us proud and content with the gifts and calling which is our inheritance from him. We are what we are by the grace of God, and our being is his gift to us. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Matthew chapter 22 verses 37 to 39 has four conditions, all of which are inseparably related. First, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Second, thou shalt love thy neighbour. And third, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Meaning that you shall love yourself and be content and happy with what God made you to be. If a man hates God, he will also then hate himself and his neighbour whatever his class or colour. If a man loves himself, he will respect and develop his own abilities instead of envying other man his abilities. Fourth, love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans chapter 13 verse 10. So that to love God and our neighbour means to obey God's law and to work no ill to our neighbour. Deep and radical divisions exist in our world today. They will not disappear either by talk of peace or by acts of war. The only remedy is the sovereign grace of God and man's response of love and obedience to God's law. Envy is a form of hatred and our world talks at length and hypocritically of love while it fosters and cultivates hatred. Peace and love are byproducts of our relationship with God. When these are made primary and are divorced from God, then they become a dangerous mask for a multitude of evils. We cannot have the gifts of God without the giver. 
The lower class mind is very different from a working class mind. The lower class mind has appeared in kings and bishops, rich men and poor men, and it is essentially an existentialist mentality, living for the present and governed by the biology of man's moment rather than by the word of God. The peace and the harmony of interest the lower class mind aims at is a graveyard peace and harmony. Before it is too late, we must examine our institutions and ourselves. Have we been contributing to class conflict and warfare, or are we working for a harmony of interests?